Hi, how are you doing? This is the third uh, shiur, the third lesson for Rashid Chokma. Uh, I'm so excited to see you all again. It's a beautiful new week. Hopefully, getting a little cooler here in Middletown. Uh, it's been a little hot lately, um, but not as hot as we will be getting spiritually, um, getting ready for the high holidays. Um, hopefully, getting inspired. Um, and really trying to start the process of figuring out where we've gone wrong, uh, what we did uh, this year, taking spiritual stock um, of ourselves and getting ready for this uh, purification experience they call the mikveh of all Israel, the, the, purif the, the purification pool of all Israel, that these days will, will purify us, those who go through them and those who prepare. Um, we will continue on with Reishi Chochma, um, Shara Tshuva today. And again, uh, please uh, email anytime you have a question uh, about anything that's taught here uh, or with any other advice or um, commentary of your own. We'll now start. What we are learning today is a sort of a continuation, uh, at least in the first paragraph of the Zohar, we were learning in our previous lesson, so if you are starting uh, now, please uh, make sure to watch our previous videos. So we begin with the famous uh, Zohar phrase, Ta chaze, come and see. How much should a person be cautious that he should not divulge from God what God's ways in this world? Come and see, right? The Zohar is famous for showing us a path towards God, a path towards who we can potentially be, coming back to ourselves again. It's funny because older Jewish literature says, Tashma, come and hear. That you're going to actually hear um, the difference. But in the Zohar, we have Tachaze, come and see. A higher state of illumination, a higher state of understanding, a higher state of learning. So again, how much should a person be cautious that he should not divulge from God's ways in the world? How much should a person be cautious? It is very easy to um, lose one's place, to get caught in another field, another understanding, um, to lose track of time, to lose track of your way in life, to find your way off the the, the, the slow path, as Rabbi Nachman says, Gesher Tsar Me'od, right, that the, the world is like a, uh, a very narrow bridge. But again, do not be afraid, as Rabbi Nachman says, because we have the path that God has set before us. The Reshit Chochma continues on. That is, if a person merits in this world and guards his soul appropriately, this is then that a person becomes desirable to God. Now this is a funny phrase here. Aren't we always desirable to God? Aren't we always children of God? True, yes, God loves us always. God recognizes God's self in us, just like a parent recognizes in a parent uh, in, in their children, their own face, their own soul. But here, we have a special ritsui, a special desire God has when he can see the pure soul and see the clean soul. Now why is this? For each human soul, God sees the potential in that soul, sees the growth potential. And when we dirty that soul, when we put ikuvim, when we prevent ourselves um, from, from getting to where we need, we can be and where we can possibly achieve in our lives spiritually, in our path, and our place towards God. If we sin by lying or, or cheating in some way or not celebrating Shabbat or, or distancing ourselves from the community, etc., etc., we all disconnect ourselves from God and we become less of what God sees in us. God has a vision for our souls and and. Our souls were originally part of God or with God, and that for that reason, God finds desirable what God set out to do. 
We try to live in God's vision. We try to become our heavenly potential, our spiritual potential, and achieve God's dream for us. If the soul is desirable, the Reishi Chochmah goes on to say, this person is praised in God's heavenly realms, saying, take a look at this holy son of mine in that world, or holy child of mine in that world. Um, this and this he did, this and this were his healing actions. Right? So up in heaven, God says, looks at that soul coming up and says, wow, look at this great soul. It was amazing. Those actions it did were unbelievable. Um, it's just, uh, as a parent would brag about a child. And interestingly enough, the Hebrew here is so interesting. It's masim amitukanim, which literally means actions that are affixed. I translate it here as healing actions. The actions that had reparative power or reparative power, that they were able to fix something in the world, fix something within the world, fix something within God, fix something within the human person, find a, a way of sustaining um, existence in that regard, each good action we do. And, and for God, that really is what attracts um, him to the soul because God sees in that soul a way of repairing his own earth, his own world um, that was his dream. And each soul is a, is a building block in God's creation in that regard. So when the soul exits from this world, meriting to be clean and pure, the Holy Blessed One shines upon it many lights, and every day calls out to it, this is the soul, name here, my child. Right? God shines a light on that soul. That soul feels the light that the Gemara says was hidden from times past. Right? That we have this um, light that is hidden for the tzaddikim, for the righteous people, and that is only experienced in Olam Haba, in the future world, and that the soul experiences this ineffable light that has been hid away since the first day of creation. Right? The yeah, first day of creation. Again, the human potential, the ability we have to be a clean, pure soul, to really be connected to God in that regard, is amazing. So now that Reishi Chochman is going to go and talk about the text, it's going to offer three notes, three commentaries it's going to have on this text, uh, and we're going to go through them, to, through them together. So this is to note to a person that after the soul began as a daughter of the King of Kings, the Holy Blessed One, and he sent the soul down to a person in this world by force. Right? So after God had this beautiful daughter, and this beautiful daughter was living in the castle, right, living with Hashem, and, and the daughter, uh, and unfortunately the king had to eject the daughter somehow and, and, and be away with her or be away from her in a totally, in almost like a crime. It's this terrible thing that the soul has to separate from God. And the reason God did this, the reason that God experienced this pain and even inflicted this pain upon himself was to bring the soul down to human beings. So we can gain a connection to God, so that we can know God in that regard through our own souls. And then, behold, a person uses the soul just for the needs of his body. When it was really sent down here for the spiritual tasks of Torah and mitzvot as it is known. Right? How is that possible? Right? Why would you just use this beautiful jewel just to... Uh, eat and, and drink and, and do your bodily needs, right? Of course, the, the soul has that ability to invivify the body so that we can eat and run and do and act within the world. But the fact of the matter is that the fact of the matter is that we we can't be that way. You know, we I mean, we can be that way, but God, that is not God's desire for us. God's desire in giving us a soul is to know God. And why do I say that? How do you know God through your own soul? That's a funny thing, right? What really is occurring is the fact that in the secret of the soul is that the soul is really part of God and God's self, right? If we picture God as this great ocean, um, God gives us a vessel from this ocean, from his ocean, right? In that vessel of water, let's say he takes a, a pitcher to the water, takes some water out and gives it. Um, and now that soul, now that water has, has, has shape, 
Uh, but the fact of the matter is that that water, that soul is still part, was still God, and it's still part of God. It's just uh, sort of disconnected from now, and at any time it can go back and mix and merge right back into the ocean again. And in that same regard, the soul is really a, a, a piece of God and God's self. And that way, through our soul and ourselves, within our own bodies, we can connect back to God again. So through our soul, our soul can become a bridge to God in that regard. One of the greatest things to do before davening is to think, who am I? Who am I as a person? Right? And you'll start to get, say to yourself, well, I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer, I'm a, you know, a construction worker, I'm a librarian, whatever you are, taxi driver, I don't know. Um, and eventually you'll keep going down. Okay, so I'm a father. Um, okay, so fine. I'm going to get scientific. I'm a human being. I'm a homo sapien, right? I'm a, you know, I, okay, maybe I'm blood vessels or I'm a skin. But the truth of the matter is what we end up getting down to is I am a soul. I am a neshama. I am a soul. That's the closest I can get to the most ontological place of my existence, the most empirical place of my own existence. Is say, I'm a soul. And in that regard, like... Through doing that, when we before we pray, we can connect to say, "Okay, wow, I'm a soul," and through that, through that soul, I can connect to God. So certainly, God is right near me. Certainly, God hears my voice. Let's keep going. Um, so we keep going in the source, um, and that it is said in the Zohar, "I send you my beautiful jewel, that you should protect it." And know me uh, through it in this world, right? That's what I basically just said, right? You, you have this beautiful. A human being is given this beautiful jewel called the neshama. They, they should protect it, and through me, through that, through that soul, you're going to know me in this world. That you're going to do the miracle of knowing God within this world, and that's unbelievable. I mean, that's really unbelievable to know the infinite God within a finite world, right? This world is a place where, where we live and die. We're, we're constantly changing. Everything is constantly dynamic. Things weren't the same it was yesterday. Um, things are constantly happening. While in God's world, God is infinite. That's exactly what God doesn't have in that regard. God is constantly uh, God. God is eternal. But yet, miraculously, those two worlds can connect together. We can know the infinite through our own souls in that regard. We can connect to God. And that was the great gift that God gave us. So, when we keep going, at least what God asks from the person is that he does not dirty what the person um, has given watch, give, that, that the person watches over by the dirt of sin, or that it's dirtied in some other way. Or um, one, and, and if it's dirtied, if it actually is dirty, one should at least try to redeem it from impure forces, right? If we should actually, um, so, so because it's such an invaluable tool, it's an invaluable item to connect to God, we should really be keeping it clean. We should be really, just as you keep clean your, your computer or your um, iPad or, or whatever it is that you value, you're going to make sure it stays clean and, and works well and looks good, right? Because you don't want it to break, right? Just the same way with your soul. We should constantly be caring for our soul in that regard, not making sure it doesn't get dirty. To go on to the next note, this is also to note that it is appropriate for a person to at least have mercy on this clean, pure jewel, right? God gave it to him, and it's not appropriate to dirty it, right? It's it's from God. Why would we want to dirty something from God? It's this pure, beautiful thing that can connect us to divine energy throughout the universe and our own being. It's this thing that gives us this great potential. Why would we ever dirty something like that, Right? And God forbid if we do dirty it, then we un we're going to have to uh, purify it at some point. And the text says in Gehinom. Right? Gehinom is the Jewish word for hell. Um, originally the word uh, was created by a valley, valley that was on the side of the Beit HaMikdash at the side of the temple in which child sacrifice actually used to happen in biblical times. And that was called um, Ge Gehinom, the valley of Gehinom. Um, and that later in rabbinic literature was changed into hell. Now, hell is very interesting in Judaism, you must know, because it, it, in some ways it's very different than, than a Christian uh, vision of hell. Um, hell is a temporary place for the soul. It is not a place that the soul will stay forever. 
There's a place where a soul might go after death to clean itself, um, or purify itself from, from the sins in the earth and, and be punished in that regard. But through that punishment, to be cleansed of the sin uh, of this world and eventually go to heaven with all the other souls. Um, it's just the amount of time that you spend in hell is, is what, what the, the punishment is here. So that's what we're talking about here. Okay? So... And this is what is said in the verse, and the spirit shall return to God, right? Kohelet says, Ecclesiastes says, and the spirit shall return to God, meaning you would give it back to God like it was given to you, meaning free of dirt of sin, right? So since God, of course, gave you a sin that was tabula rasa, right, that was kind of uh, empty of defects and, and perfectly beautiful um, and ready to serve the body and ready to serve uh, as a connection point between God and man, Right, you would want to give it back just as clean. Right, there's the laws are very strict within uh, Jewish law of uh, what's called um, the, uh, ownership uh, or watching over a, a product that is borrowed from someone else. Right, in Jewish law, if we are to borrow something, meaning the law of the shoel, if we are to bother something, uh, I'm sorry, borrow something, um, we there are different uh, restrictions on how well we have to take care of that product and they're pretty pretty high depending on how much you have to pay to borrow it or you rent it or or whatever it is are you protecting it some way um, but regardless you have to um, there are a lot of harsh standards that are are that are on the person who is taking care of a, an object for another person and we are those are applicable to us as people who have are taking care of God's uh, gifts to us God's beautiful gems which are the souls that he has given us and it won't stop here and says but of course, um, but one should not give uh, it back to God in adornments of, but one should not give it back to God just exactly the way it is, but rather he should even adorn it. He should adorn it with Torah and mitzvot. Because if you give it back in just the way you received it, what's the point of the soul coming to the world, right? There has to be some point uh, of the soul coming to the world besides it just forcing it to go down, right? Of course, we talked about the soul is a connecting point between God and man, but we might as well also do Torah and mitzvot because Torah and mitzvot adorn that soul. So we can actually give it back to God with thanks and say, look, we even made this soul more beautiful. Because to be honest, God can't do Torah and mitzvot. Right? God can't uh, you know, do Torah and mitzvot like the unique opportunity we have in this world. In some ways, the, 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 divine, the divine realm seeks after our temporal ability to do actions within this world that are holy. And they're holy because we have a choice of not to doing them, right? We are making the choice either to, to put on tefillin that morning, to, to observe Shabbat, to give charity, to be good, right? These are actions you choose to do. And a lot of divine, divine creatures, like angels for that matter, can't make a decision in that regard, right? God tells them what to do and they have to do it. While human beings, we are having a unique ability to have that choice. So the choice that you take to learn Torah or the choice that you take to do another mitzvah of some sort is an adornment to that soul. It's an adornment uh, even making that soul better, giving it something it didn't have before. Right? So, therefore, the soul receives that and as and it's a, a kind of a gift we give to God in that regard. Lastly, it gives another note. Thirdly, it should be noted that one should rouse themselves to return in tshuva. When one thinks that the Shekhinah is expelled around them, as it is written, and in your sins, she was sent away from you from Isaiah chapter 50, uh, verse 1. The, the idea here, the philosophy here, is that God's presence, um, that God has a presence within the world. And that that presence uh, is actually living with us and is attached to us. And because of our sins, when we were sent out of Eretz Yisrael, God had to expel us, and we had much less of a connection to God because we're expelled from Eretz Yisrael. We don't have the Beit HaMikdash. We don't have the Kodesh HaKodeshim. We don't have the Holy of Holies. We don't do the sacrifices. But what does God do? God sends His Holy Spirit out with us, right? His Shekhinah, we might call it, the indwelling presence of God, to follow us around in exile, right? Um, and that really is... You know, we, we have that presence. We have that presence, the Gemara says, when we pray as ten Jews in a minion. We have that presence when we learn Torah with a partner, etc., um, etc. Et that is the presence that, that we feel in this world. 
Also, I would say the presence we have when we're having a family meal, that presence we feel when we're hiking in the woods, that presence we feel when we're in the ocean, um, that presence whenever we feel God within ourselves, that, that is the indwelling presence of God in that regard. But there was this, there is this great catastrophe because not only are we in exile, but God and God's self, God's presence in this world is almost detached from the transcendent part of God. God almost is detached from God's self in that regard. And in some ways, our doing tshuva, our returning to God, also brings God's presence back to God and God's self. So not only are we helping our own souls, but in that way we are also bringing and uniting God in that self. And that's why we say in prayer, On that day, God shall be one, and so too shall his name be one. Right? God is God. God's name is God's dwelling presence within the world. Right? Both, both God, but different ways that God is within the world. Right? And we really want them united. We want the transcendent world connected with the finite world of everyday reality. Right? We don't want God disconnected from God's self. That wasn't God's <laughs> original intention. That's not the real, uh, the real aspect of what God really is. That in our own eyesight, we think that there's this separation, but that's just because of our not ability to do true tshuva. If we did true tshuva, there would be a, a God would really truly be connected to God's self. So let's continue here. Um, If freeing her from spiritual exile depends on doing tshuva, why should every person not be roused in tshuva to lighten her load of exile and shine on into her what is damaged within her? But instead we lengthen the exile. So I almost imagine the Shekhinah as a female um, beggar with a stick over her shoulder with a, you know, what little food she has, dust all over her um, and she's trying to follow us around in our exile. And no matter how much fancy, fancy uh, houses we have or uh, BMWs we drive, she's still dressing, walking around in her dirt, um, eating scraps off the floor until we can do tshuva, until we can clean her off and connect her back with her father again, connect her back with God, connect her back um, with God, with God's self once more and have that full connection of God being one once more. And we walk around with that, a weakened presence of God within the world, a presence of God that's been stamped on the floor. Um, but we can heighten that presence. We can uh, make that presence more clear in the world by doing good things uh, for people in the world, by doing mitzvot, um, by studying Torah, by doing tshuva, by doing tshuva this high holidays. And, but we don't. Instead, we lengthen the exile. We lengthen her exile. Let's keep going. So this aspect is explained in the Tikkun HaZohar. Now, what is the Tikkun HaZohar? It is a part of Zoharic literature. It's part, another um, type of book of the Zohar. Um, it was, it's composed of 70 chapters called 70 Tikkunim, which are all different homiletic comment, Kabbalistic homiletic commentaries on the first verse of the Torah, um, Bereshi Bra Elokim the Shemayim Vet Aretz, right? In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. They're all commentaries on that first, uh, first line, and they're supposed to be the seventy faces of the Torah. Latikon Ezor says, "Oi to humanity, that God is bound with him in exile, and His divine presence is also bound with humanity." As it is said about this, a prisoner cannot free himself from his imprisonment, right? God, in our sins, he bound God, bound God's self. God is somehow indefinitely attached to us uh, forever, that permanently attached to us forever with the Shekhinah. The Shekhinah is bound to B'nai Yisrael. Um, and, you know, for that reason, obviously God is <laughs> bound to his own divine presence, so God too is bound to us in that regard. And in that way, in some ways, God himself is imprisoned within our sins. So in that way... Um, his divine presence is also bound with humanity. In that regard, um, we know there's there's a there's a place in the Talmud, in Brachot, that that uh, it, it talks about um, um, a sick person, a sick rabbi, not being able to heal himself from his sickness um, by the normal miracles of life, um, 
and he answers and he says that a prisoner cannot free himself from his imprisonment, right? The, because I'm the one who's sick, the rabbi, right? The rabbi who normally works miracles, let's say, to fix someone else, can't work miracles on himself because a prisoner can't free himself from his own prison. In the same way, you know, the Shekhinah can't uh, free the, herself from a prison unless we do tshuva, unless we free the Shekhinah in that way, in which we can relate to God within our world and say, we're doing this for God's presence, for God's presence to be revealed within this world. Right? Her redemption is truly by tshuva, the great upper mother. She is dependent upon the actions of Israel. So her redemption is by tshuva, uh, called the great upper mother. In, in Aramaic, it's uh, bina ila'a, Right, which was is the upper upper understanding. This is in reference to a sefirah, um, which are ten um, ways that God represents God within God's self within reality. We can go deeper into it uh, a little later. But for right now, this is a bina is a way of looking at God that is a very high way of looking at God, uh, very very close to the way God's actual existence is. But of course, not actual God's existence because we can't ever actually truly know God, right? God is so infinite that we can never actually know what God is. We only have our uh, perception of what God is. Um, it, but it's the perception of God as this, like, massive ocean, this big yam, this big sea that has, like, infinite potential and infinite ability and infinite raw energy in that regard to be used. Um, that is where tshuva comes from, because in tshuva, we have the ability to achieve infinite things. Each soul has the infinite ability to gr climb higher and to elevate oneself to a higher reality. So, that chuba, it's all dependent upon the actions of Israel. Right? That there are, and in, in Bina, that there are 50 great gates of freedom with her. Within Bina, within this 50 pool, in the, within this great ocean, this way of viewing God as this great ocean, there are 50 gates of experiencing this great ocean, this great potential of God, and corresponds with the 50 times exiting Egypt is mentioned in the Torah. This is the idea of Nun Share Bina. Nun Share Bina, 50 gates of, of, of understanding, is mentioned within the Talmud itself. right? And the Kabbalah goes and starts to uh, try to understand it in a deeper way. And so this is uh, another time when the Kabbalah is trying to understand the concept that was already brought within the Gemara, within the Talmud. Um, by saying that the 50 gates of freedom are the 50 are signified, are hinted at by the 50 times in which going out of Yitziat Mitzrayim, the exiting of Egypt, is mentioned within the, the, the Torah. Meaning, of course, leaving Egypt is not a physical place of, of slavery, but a, a spiritual uh, place of, of freedom that one can go to. And this is what is written, uh, this is what... Uh, and this is what it means in the Torah when it says, Vayifen ko vako, Moses turned this way and that. Um, this way is ko, meaning kaf he, and kaf he, every Hebrew word can turn into a number. That number is, is kaf, which is 20, he, which is 5, 25, and that way, which is also 25, 25 plus 25 equals 50. That's the meaning of Vayifen ko vako, God turned here and here, meaning God... Moses turned to all the ways of the 50 ways of understanding God, the 50 under, the 50 gates of understanding. And so, in just the same way, with these same 50 letters, God unites two times per day. So, if we actually look at it, Shema, when we say Shema Yisrael, Shem Elokein, Shem Echad, that's 25 letters. Baruch Shem Kavod Malchut Olei Olam Ve'ed, that's also 25 letters. 25 plus 25, 50. That's Vayifen Kovako. So, the Kabbalistic explanation of that verse, when Moses turned this way and that, when he was getting ready to uh, kill the Egyptian man that was hurting a Hebrew slave, was that he recited the Shema in a really holy way. Right? He, he, he recited the Shema with so much clinging to God, so much the Vekut, that in, in, in God, the Moshe achieved so much that the Egyptian had to stop from his sin. Right? It's a very mystical way of looking at that, that part. Right? And he saw that there was no man around. Right? So that person had to die because there is no person around. There's no person to illuminate that person who was hurting the Egyptian, the, the, the uh, Jewish slave uh, in, in Shuba and therefore save them. So, of course, the unhappy uh, outcome of the Egyptian dying by the hand of Moshe um, because there was nowhere to fix his sin. This is the end of the Shior today for um, our Reishi Chochmah lesson. Um, it's really been uh, an honor and a pleasure to learn with you. 
I hope you're enjoying this. Um, again, please uh, give me any advice on how to get better. I'm still working on the, uh, the video thing. Um, but I will talk to you soon. And uh, it's really been a pleasure. Thank you.